Welcome to the Healthy Hair Podcast. Your host, Dr. Amy Brenner, is a board-certified OBGYN with additional certifications in functional and integrative medicine. This podcast is meant to help women find reliable, relevant information to help them feel better, look better, and live better. Here, you will hear in-depth information about hormones, sexual medicine, aesthetics, cosmetic gynecology, and functional medicine. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Healthy Her. Today we're going to talk about something that if you've ever been pregnant, you can most likely relate. The ways women's bodies change during pregnancy and after is endless. Pain, swelling, hormone fluctuations, all of it. So today we're joined by an expert in helping deal with some of that pain, Dr. Carolyn Moyers. Thanks for joining us, Carolyn. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Yeah, so happy to have you. So I know this is one of your focuses, and um, we were just talking off air, and uh, I said, oh, this we should we should record this. So why don't we just pick up to where we we're what we were talking about of how what's your story, what's your background, what are you doing now, and how did you get into focusing on the aches and pains of pregnancy and postpartum. Sure. It um, has definitely been a treacherous path, right? <laughs> like everyone thinks I know so. everybody <laughs> has a story like, <laughs> right. So I am a board certified ob and I did a neuromusculoskeletal medicine fellowship. And I did that as I was finishing osteopathic medical school, because when I applied to medical school, you know, I went at in-state tuition. There were eight schools in the state of Texas at the time that I applied. One of them happened to be osteopathic. You know, it goes into the pool, you rank, you get matched, et cetera. I matched at the osteopathic school. And as I was finishing my second year, I thought, you know, I'm going to finish osteopathic school. And really, I don't know if I'm going to be comfortable using the skill set consistently. And so I decided to do the fellowship in neuromuscular skills. So I didn't even know about this fellowship. Yeah. So I guess if you can expand, because if, if I don't know that, I'm sure our listeners don't know what that means. Yeah. So osteopathic manipulative treatment um, or OMT for short is essentially that special hands-on skill set that osteopaths have, right? Because we learn all the medicine, we dissect the cadaver, you know, we, we do all the things uh, like an MD, but this additional and um, hands-on skill set is that thing that kind of sets us apart. And I just thought, Hmm. I don't know that I'm going to be able to utilize this properly and really understand it. So um, the fellowship allowed me it was a, uh, to get a dual degree in clinical research and education, but also teach lectures to the medical students on osteopathic principles and techniques um, to have weekly clinics um, in the osteopathic clinic with um, the professors and um, with the, with the professors and, and the attendings um, to kind of oversee our techniques and diagnoses. And so I have always loved um, OB-GYN uh, as I started going through my rotations. This is what I was kind of leaning towards. So I was always giving the low back and pelvic lecture. And so it was much later in my practice that I kind of came back to this, but it's interesting that, you know, I kind of followed that interest as I was finishing medical school and it was just a plus one. Um, so ours was set up as a pre-doctoral fellowship. So like while I was in medical school, I was doing this. My third year was split over two years. Uh, they also have like a plus one. So after you finish medical school, you could do this one year fellowship in osteopathic oh, that's medicine. awesome that was never yeah. an option where i was in medical school yeah it's it was pretty neat um i'm happy to have the skill set um in residency you know i used it here and there mostly on colleagues you know fellow residents um there's occasionally like a woman come in with severe pain in to the um, emergency room and she had a rib out of place and i was able to identify it it was an acute onset of pain took her to the or actually because it had the best like firm surface to the table and was able to put it back in place and everybody came to watch because it was so different than anything they knew interesting so then you do a traditional residency in OBGYN, correct Correct. Yes. Yep. I was in, um, in, I did an MD residency. So it, honestly, half and half um, residents were DOs and MDs. 
It's pretty equally And then split. did you practice of, in private practice as a traditional OBGYN? Yeah, so I did a rural health commitment right out of residency and um, spent five years in uh, private practice as an OBGYN. And we relocated um, to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I was having my third baby. And, you know, it was just a time where I thought I'm going to lean into my family because I was filling this constant pool between, you know, I was disappointing myself or my patients or my family. Um, and so I just decided it was it was time to do something a little bit different to allow me some flexibility with my family. So I did OB hospitalist work for a while, kind of part time. Um, spent some time as a medical director, um, helped develop a gen program for a hormone replacement therapy clinic, ultimately went back to full-time OB hospitalist work for a couple of years while I really worked on what it was exactly I wanted to do and create. Um, and I had this just little voice in my head and I was wanting to create this boutique gen practice that really honored the health of women um, and, and it allowed me to practice authentically. And it wasn't until I met somebody who had a practice exactly what I like what I was envisioning, um, who really challenged me to own my secret sauce. Like, what is that thing that makes you unique? And I really just rolled around with that for a long time because like in a town of a hundred OBGYNs, what makes me unique? And that's when I came back to this hands-on skill set that I have. And I've been so excited to use. Um, I, so my practice is um, Sky Women's Health. It's a boutique gynecology and osteopathy practice. And I really target my osteopathic treatment for pregnant and postpartum women because the results are just phenomenal. Because anybody who's been pregnant can tell you pregnancy is uncomfortable. It's hard. It's a vulnerable and scary time. Pain during pregnancy is common, but that doesn't mean it's normal or that you have to live with it. I wish I would have known you uh, 18 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I had three babies back to back to back. And yeah. I would say I, I hated being pregnant. Like after the yeah. initial like, okay, I know what it feels like. Like, and, and, and it is amazing. Like I, like it's, it's a phenomenal feeling to have a human growing inside of you and, but it's a long time to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it's a long time to feel uncomfortable. You're absolutely right. And our body goes through so many musculoskeletal changes, right? I mean, just the physical changes of pregnancy, our blood volume increases, our center of gravity shifts as our uterus grows and stretches our abdominal muscles, which play a role in back pain because our abdominal muscles help to support the spine um, and it helps to support the, the health of our back. And so, you know, are those muscles are being stretched and weakened. You know, we've got our breasts are growing and becoming heavy. <laughs> Everything is just out of whack. Um, and it leaves women feeling really uncomfortable it, it, pelvic pain and back pain are the two most common complaints that I see. And it's 50 to 70% of women. So, you know, a large majority of women who are pregnant are uncomfortable. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you, like, how common is it? I was going to say, is it 100%? But, uh, but I guess there are some people that feel great when they're pregnant and they love it yeah. and it doesn't phase them. Yeah. I was not so, one of those people. <laughs> so how do you know, or even just as a, if, if other OBGYNs are listening to this is how do you know when intervention or seeing somebody like yourself as a specialist for um, pelvic or back pain during pregnancy is how do you know when it's normal or when, when to intervene and see a specialist like yourself? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I typically say if the pain is acute or severe or last for longer than two weeks, then obviously you need to call your OBGYN first because you need to rule out, you know, whether you have a urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis or preterm labor or placental abruption, like there's all kinds of things that could go wrong and all kinds of scary reasons to have back or pelvic pain in pregnancy. Um, so, but, you know, what I'm addressing is the musculoskeletal um, discomforts of pregnancy. And um, if it is something else along those lines, then of course that requires a, an appropriate evaluation. Um, you know, if you had vaginal bleeding or vaginal pain or, you know, leaking fluid or things like that, then obviously that needs to be um, checked out, you know, either in the OB emergency department or with your OBGYN first. And so when I often see patients, they have 
gone to the OB emergency department or seen their OB-GYN or seen the chiropractor or the massage therapist and they're just really trying to get relief. And, you know, I've seen patients as early as, you know, 14 weeks and, you know, all the way through their pregnancy and then in their postpartum period. Because in our postpartum period, the pain kind of shifts from that pelvis and, and low back. Um, so then we start having upper back pain because we're doing all the lifting and the holding and the swaddling and the breastfeeding. Um, so it's just a, a different set of uh, pain. That's, that's great. Is there any testing or are there any tests to know? Like, should I see a physical therapist? Should I see a, a specialist like yourself that does manipulation? Should I just get a massage once a week? How do you know what direction to go? That's a great question. So I would start with your OBGYN or your midwife. Um, and you know, in terms of special tests, I mean, I do a full assessment, watch the patient's gait when they come in, you know, how are they walking? How are they carrying themselves? You know, where are the pain points kind of identifying those and make sure that it is a musculoskeletal issue. You know, I mean, could there be a bulging disc? Could there be other issues? Uh, you know, patients see me who have had, um, you know, horseback riding injuries or gymnastics injury or motor vehicle accidents or things like that in the past that pregnancy exacerbates. Um, but a large majority is just pregnancy is uncomfortable, right? And so typically I am not having to do anything more than a detailed physical exam. Um, it would be rare that I would be ordering an MRI and that would be something that would be in conjunction with like orthopedics or something of that nature. Now you mentioned physical therapy. Um, I work in conjunction with pelvic floor physical therapy because I think that, that is so important for pregnancy and postpartum recovery and actually incorporate them into my office. So we work collaboratively. So that where I may realign the spine and the hips and work through some exercises and, and some stretches that I want them to do, and that helps to sustain their results over several weeks. Um, specifically for pelvic floor, a pelvic floor physical therapist is just they're primed for that, right? Like as an OBGYN, we know all the anatomy, but we're not necessarily assessing the strength of the pelvic floor as we're doing pelvic exams <laughs> for the most part, right? And so that's where they can come in and really help to strengthen that pelvic floor. And why does that matter? Urinary incontinence, pelvic pressure, uh, pain with intercourse, just a, a number of things. That's awesome. Um, what's the success rate of helping alleviate or diminish uh, pain during pregnancy or, or the postpartum period? Or is it just something like you just have to live with and we'll do some things to just you do some things to take the edge off? I think it varies from patient to patient, right? Because I've had some who come in and are like, my pain's gone after the first visit. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're a unicorn, but you're welcome. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very rare. Um, I have had the, the vast majority. It's usually two or three visits in where they're like, why did I wait so long to come and see you? Like, I thought I was going to have to suffer in pain or women who have told me, you know, with my last pregnancy, I was in pain from eight to 10 weeks. And that kept me from wanting to even have another pregnancy. And I'm so glad that I found you. Um, so typically they're getting significant relief. Um, I tend to push out their visits. And now of course it's customized to each patient, right? If somebody comes in a really acute pain, I may just need to see them, you know, once a week for two or three visits until we kind of get them in a good spot. And then we kind of mirror the OB visits that they would have with their OB gen or their midwife. Um, it is sometimes two or three visits and they're on their way. I never see them again. Right. And then some women are like, this is so amazing. I'm coming back. And then they come postpartum and then they send their mother to see me, you know, <laughs> And it's just one of those, like, this feels so good. It's so amazing. And I think really um, patients enjoy the fact that I'm an ob -GYN. You know, they're not just seeing a chiropractor or a massage therapist. Yeah. I can kind of talk them through, counsel them through, like, everything that's going on or if they have additional questions from their ob -GYN. Sometimes I just feel like I'm kind of... Um, the translator, <laughs> for lack of a better explanation, you know, like they may have had a quick visit with their ob and gotten told a couple of things, and then they still have questions about it. And so I kind of help work them through that. Um, and so it's just been so much fun. It's been such a joy to see the great results is just like, hey, look at this, this osteopathic thing really works. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, what are also what a relief like, is 
<laughs> so many um, patients when they're see when they're seeing somebody that's not an OBGYN when they're pregnant of wondering, well, is this safe? So seeing yeah. you, I'm sure, provides a reassurance that you know, obviously, you're not going to do anything that's unsafe for the baby. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that that is a concern. Like whenever I approach one of my DO colleagues um, to let her know what I was doing in the community, she was excited. But at the same time, she was like, you're not going to try to vert babies in the office, are you? And I'm like <laughs> looking at her with my, you know, one eyebrow up and uh, wondering what in the world she's talking about. And she's like, I had a patient come in from a chiropractor's office recently and we went back for an emergency C-section. Um, because baby was in fetal distress, heart tones were down and, um, she, the patient reported that, you know, the baby was aggressively manipulated in the office to try to turn baby into a head down position. Yeah. So if, if anybody's listening, if they don't know what vert means, it's a, it's a version of if the yeah. baby's breech to try to flip the baby to a head down position, and it's something that OBGYNs or at least when I, is that still a thing? I don't know. It's been 11 yes. years, but when I did, when <laughs> yes. I was in practice, I would attempt to do that on the labor and delivery suite periodically. Yes. And it, yes, exactly. It is done in the hospital where baby is continuously monitored because a number of things can go wrong. And so it's important that mama and baby are monitored. Is there anything somebody can do either before they're pregnant or as soon as they're pregnant so they don't have to see you or to prevent the the back pain and discomfort of pregnancy? Well, I mean, exercise, <laughs> exercise yeah. is key. Um, I think, you know, keeping this a strong body um, and that's something that we really promote a lot. I actually sponsor one of the local mom groups because it's one of my passions that you can continue to be active in pregnancy. Um, and so also working with a, a pelvic floor physical therapist is a great idea. Yeah. So just as far as the exercise goes, I know that at least when I was doing OB, which was again, 10 plus years ago, there were still so many doctors that were telling women like, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. What do you tell your patients of, versus now I go to a, a, a CrossFit gym and there's, there's always pregnant women there. And at age 52, like sometimes when you're doing something, I'm like, okay, I can't let this pregnant lady like beat me with <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. I've seen that in Orange Theory when she's on the treadmill and I'm like, I am not going to be outrun. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, I was that pregnant woman who was swimming, biking, running in, I mean, I ran a marathon and a half marathon um, pregnant um, early in pregnancy though. I wouldn't recommend that you know, <laughs> second, yeah. like second, I couldn't third run when I was a pregnant, pre I couldn't run when I was pregnant. I felt like these things were going to fall out, but is there any advice that you give to people these days about, are there things that you can't do when you're pregnant as far as exercise goes? Yeah. We don't want any high contact sports. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's key. We want to minimize risk of fall and injury in that regard, but um, you know, exercise reduces back pain. It eases constipation. It decreases your risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, cesarean section. It promotes healthy weight during pregnancy and it improves your fitness and strengthens your heart and your blood vessels. So I say go for it. It's going to help to um, help you to feel better overall. But again, a large majority of pregnant women have low back pain and they want to maintain their active lifestyle, whether it's hiking. I mean, I did have one who was a CrossFit gal and another who was a deadlifter. And I'm just like, my mouth is like to the floor. And I'm like, at some point we have to stop this, but I want to support <laughs> your endeavors um, to the point that it is safe. And so typically I say you can continue to exercise um, to the level that you're trained, right? So if we have somebody who is a consistent runner or a yogi or something of that nature, you know, we want them to continue doing the things that they've always done, that they're comfortable with, as long as we're maintaining balance and avoiding high contact, like, you know, being run over in soccer or something of that nature. Right. But there's no reason why you can't lift weights, correct? I can't see any reason why. That you is correct. Lift. That is correct. But when you're doing, so this is why I say it's important to see a pelvic floor physical therapist. With a pelvic floor physical therapist, I feel like I'm the evangelist for getting pelvic floor physical therapy because they um, do such a great job and they train you and how, what you need to do with your body um, and how to do those workouts safely and effectively. 
So if you are going to lift, there's proper ways to lift. And so there are some gyms who have programs that are supporting pregnant mamas who are wanting to stay active. Um, and those are definitely my favorite. That would be like my top tier recommendations. See if that pelvic floor physical therapist want to train yourself when you are going to the gym or if you're doing this at home so that you don't cause injury. Um, I never will forget the woman who came in eight months postpartum who swore something was falling out. And her OBGYN had ruled everything out and sent her to me. And we do a you know, pelvic organ prolapse quantification. So this detailed pelvic exam looking for any prolapse, anything falling out of the vagina. Her anatomy was completely normal, but this pressure and sensation that she was experiencing was very real. And so we kind of worked through all the different things that had happened, you know, in delivery and postpartum and where we wanted to go from there. Pelvic floor physical therapy. She did consistently for a month. And she told me at her follow-up that her symptoms were gone and that her urinary incontinence was gone, which she didn't even mention at the time because she was so concerned about this intense pelvic pressure that she had at the end of every day. Yeah, I, I think pelvic floor therapy physical therapy is just wonderful. A lot of times patients are like, what are you talking about? Like physical therapy for my pelvis? Like if you could just give a little elevator speech of like, what do they do in pelvic floor physical therapy? <laughs> That's a great question. So I um, actually went to a pelvic floor physical therapist because I was like, Hey, I've had four babies. I'm sure I could benefit. And I'm super curious because I'm recommending it for everybody. <laughs> So um, I know nothing better to learn about it when you go through them versus when you go through it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So the pelvic floor, you know, consists of this layer of muscles that stretch like a supportive hammock from the pubic bone in front to the lower end of the uh, backbone. And your pelvic floor is made up of this layers of muscles and ligaments and connective tissue that surround the vagina and rectum. And we usually don't think about it. Right. But these muscles support our organs in the pelvis, including the bladder, the uterus, the bowel, and they help during urination and intercourse and obviously childbirth. Um, and they undergo like great strain and in pregnancy and childbirth. And so we want to rehab those muscles. And with pelvic floor physical therapy, they are not only assessing, you know, the pelvic floor. I think a lot of people get anxious about the fact that there may be an internal piece to that exam. Um, a large majority of it is your hips, your deep abdominal core muscles, and then the pelvic floor because they all are interconnected and work together. And so part of your exercise regimen is includes all of that. Um, and in terms of the internal, it's typically one finger, and we're identifying where the muscles are tight. Um, can, are we doing a Kegel properly? What's the strength of the Kegel? You know, things like that. Um, so that is a small piece of your entire visit. And typically a handful of visits and you're on your way with the tools to maintain this. It's just a matter of actually doing the exercises. Yeah, that was my next question is about Kegels. I'd say most most women like think like, okay, I, yeah, I've been told about Kegels. I should but do But I don't them. think most of us are doing it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask what you, what's your physical therapist is going to help you with. What's your opinion on Kegels? Can I just do Kegels and prevent all of this from happening too? Or will that help? I mean, it can be helpful, but not everybody needs Kegels. As much as we talk about Kegels and everybody knows about Kegels for the most part, not everybody needs it. If you have a hypertonic pelvic floor, Kegels are the worst thing you can do. It's actually going to worsen your symptoms. And you would only know that unless you saw somebody like yourself or even a pelvic floor physical yeah. therapist. Right, right. Yeah. So I work in conjunction with pelvic floor physical therapists with, you know, treating with our, our musculoskeletal system, right. To the most, to the most of our ability, the best of our ability to treat urinary incontinence, um, SI joint pain, pelvic pain, painful sex, tailbone pain, sciatica, pelvic organ prolapse, constipation, even some endometriosis, uh, you know, prepping for labor and delivery and the low back and pelvic pain and diastasis recti. So, I mean, it's just, the list is endless. <laughs> Yeah. What a blessing for the women uh, of Texas, like have you as a resource, like, so it's not something you just need to deal with and basically be on b bed rest for the majority of your pregnancy. There's actually things that can be done. hundred percent. 
A hundred percent. You just have to get to my office. <laughs> yeah. So where can people find you? Yeah. So um, I, my practice is Sky Women's Health and we are in Fort Worth. You can find me on social at Sky Women's Health or at Dr. Carolyn Moyers um, on Instagram and Facebook. And then we also have a podcast called Sky Women. Thank you so much for joining us and, and giving us this hope so people don't have to have the, the negative Nelly attitude like I had about pregnancy. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome. Absolutely. I mean, that's my mission to let you know that you're not whiny <laughs> and that there are solutions. Like I was watching some OMT videos and, and this guy was treating women and says, you know, oftentimes women tend to be whiny. And I'm like, uh, no, you have never been pregnant. It is incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> Somebody is invading your body as you are growing this tiny human. You know, <laughs> It is super uncomfortable. There is definitely hope to optimize how you feel. I say every woman uh, deserves a joyful pregnancy. And it's my aim to partner with your OB provider to help make that happen. Thanks so much, Dr. Moyers. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Healthy Her. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and the web. Go to www.dramybrenner.com to learn more. This podcast is for general information only and does not constitute as medical advice the practice of medicine, nursing, or other healthcare services. No patient-physician relationship is formed. The information in the podcast and any references, material, or links are at the sole discretion of the listener and not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Listeners should not delay or disregard obtaining medical advice for any medical issues or diagnoses that they may have and should seek medical advice from their healthcare provider for any such conditions.